slightly, slightly, definitely not novel, but you know, novel, novel for us. Um, a way to to kind of dynamically build some front ends, um, but using kind of the normal Drupal entity configuration system. So, um, and it turns out there's some existing framework for sort of doing this thing and integrating with a Vue.js based framework called Nuxt. I don't know why you need a framework on top of Vue.js, but so if anyone's heard of Nuxt and wants to explain to me what it's about, uh, that would be helpful. Or we could just look at the website. <laughs> no. All right. Anybody else? Things they're uh, thinking about? We can look at Nux first, maybe. Uh, I have a quick question. Sure. Sorry, it's really quick. It's just a general question. So do you guys meet up uh, kind of daily? No, this is a monthly. We do it every second Thursday. Uh, we also hang oh, out so in cool. uh, Drupal Slack because we evolved from a Drupal specific meetup. So you'll hear the word Drupal a lot because a lot of us come from that. Um, back Wait, end. what is it? Uh, Drupal. Drupal, uh, Drupal it's an open, open source uh, content management system that's been around for 20 years. Hard to believe, yeah. 20 years this year. Um, Jeez, okay. Well, you guys are gonna laugh at me, but I'm 24 years old. So, I've started yeah. the journey. It's all good. So uh, yeah, you're in the uh, the PHP Renaissance right now, uh, and the uh, JavaScript uh, explosion. Every week, there's something new in JavaScript land. So lots oh, to learn. God, it's kind of annoying. <laughs> well, you got. I feel like you. You know, you got. You got to. You know. Yeah, you know, kind of pick a uh, pick your uh, pick your horse and and you know go with it to some degree. Yeah. You know, as long as you're not betting on something that's like you know super duper brand new, you're probably in a pretty good good position. Um, in terms of yeah, health. tell something else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think a lot of these new things, like it's a lot about you know understanding the basics, the fundamental things, and then you can move around because like. Throughout your career, you're going to end up like having new stuff. Like Peter is working with Vue right now, which is a JS framework, um, UI framework, and you know primarily was like a PHP guy, right? So like you know, kind of outside. Yeah, I, I still hate JavaScript, but you know. I... Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> JavaScript is actually this uh, the tech stack that I'm learning. So. <laughs> Is it React specific, or are you learning like fundamental JavaScript stuff? Uh, uh, fundamentals for now. Uh, we we like recently got into the front end, so we're learning. Um, we're learning. We're learning on like using like loops and arrays right now, and then um, in a couple of weeks we're going to be going into the back end. I know, like at the very end of it, they teach some React, but um, I, I know they said like uh, we we nice have like yeah, yeah, like in in our um. In, in our boot camp, uh, we're supposed at the end of it, like they have like partners that we do um, job interviews with. So they said like it's not really required for us to learn React because a lot of the times with jobs, when you go into a job, you go through like their own little boot camp, and if they mm -hmm. want React, you will learn React there. But right. it's like pretty much trying to get like the uh, get in through the lowest bar, the fastest mm -hmm. way. Yep, I'm learning those fundamentals oh, cool. so that you can do other things. Yeah. Cool. Which one is that? Is it the Rutgers one or something else? Uh it, it's 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 uh it's something else. It's called Resilient Coders. It's like uh it's a it's online but it's Boston based. Uh that's where it started. Oh okay, cool. There's a bunch of them, so it's always interesting to hear different people's takes. We've had a a lot of people through the Rutgers one come to the meetup over the course of the past couple of years, so uh, interesting to see how the program is a little bit different between these different things. All right. Uh, so let's look at next real quick, I guess, and then we'll go from there. Sounds good. All right. So, so, so Peter's, Peter's big question was, I don't know why you would need another thing on top of Vue.js. Right. I think this is the loaded question of the night. <laughs> so Sean, I, I, I'm counting on your, your brilliance at, at off the cuff, you know, <laughs> analysis too. 
but, or, or, and, and, or or paying attention to too many things at once. <laughs> yeah, or uh, and maybe we'll we'll let we can let Ian introduce himself and then you then you oh, yeah, go for it. ten seconds to look at look at the Nux website. <laughs> I know what Nux is. I know what it is. Oh, you do? Oh, you already know. Yeah. Oh, wow. oh, yeah, yeah. Is he is a he, he is a, what do they call it a Renaissance man? Yes. <laughs> Something like that. Who is John? John, yes. Cool. Um, is there a question on the night? Oh yes, uh, your favorite seasoning. My favorite seasoning hmm. for food. Oh, uh, vinegar on my chips. On my <laughs> vinegar on chips again. A condiment. Mm. Three condiments. All right, we're allowing it. Pesto, I think, could be a condiment. Pesto is a condiment. Yeah, oh, it's a sauce. You know. Um, Ian, what do you do these days? Uh, I just finished two months of soccer camps, and I am now allergic to kids and soccer. Uh, <laughs> and I'm looking for a, a real job um, in Drupal, somehow, somewhere. Uh, so, if anybody knows of anything, let me know. Uh, yeah, there's right, a couple. I actually of... just got off the, an organization call with uh -huh. Drupal Camp NYC, who have, who are, had planned to go uh, hybrid, but have decided it'll be a virtual. Well, it'll be almost 100% virtual. They are still potentially going to do a a social event on the Thursday night, but everything else will be online. That's what I'm up to. I, f I feel like it's easier for senior devs to get a job. Well, Kathy posted something in, uh, I think it was in Slack, about a lullabot discussion, mm -hmm. which I haven't listened to all of, but basically they said they weren't going to train anybody. It's a tough shit if you weren't, <laughs> a, senior, if you weren't a senior dev. It was kind of, uh, I haven't listened to it all, but it was kind of... Uh, sad uh, somebody made the comment uh let's start ups because they have money train people we can't afford to do it mm -hmm. uh, and then they basically went down that line which uh i'm not sure if is kathy going to join us tonight i think it's no i don't think so she was she's uh yeah been under the weather so yeah i think it's a discussion we should continue but i think yeah we, it would be good for kathy to be online yeah yeah I mean, I know we, yeah, we're sort of talking about it, but it's like where our team has fallen off that, yeah, it's really hard to have the capacity to bring people in and train them and get the other work done at the same time. Um, right. So, yeah, uh, I sort of advocating for the, you to know, have a little more of someone in a manager, engineering manager role. So that might make it easier to keep mm -hmm. like new people on track. Um, mm -hmm. Other than right now, yeah, our boss basically depends on everyone being highly self-directed, which works about half the time. <laughs> <laughs> Especially now. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that could be something we talked about too. Like the, how do you get your foot in the door and get leveled up? Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's generally, I don't think that's necessarily a tech problem, right? I think that's a general, sure. I think it's a general, um, you know, em, employment problem in the world at least in the u.s is that there's not like apprenticeships you know there's not like things to get you in the door so you can get the skills you need to do the next job right um or to, you know, grow in a position i think it's it's a something i think that's true in general but i think it's specifically in the drupal world it's it's even more of a problem because there is such a a gap between entry level and senior level mm -hmm. and, and getting from point A to point B is so difficult on your own. Um, and frankly, on any given day, you could feel like a junior, a senior or give it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I'm just sick of seeing or hearing people in the Drupal world complain they can't hire people, you know, mm -hmm. and, then say, and then saying all oh, they'll hire is the senior people. Right. You know? So anyway, yep. I'll, I'll jump off that soapbox. <laughs> all good, all good. All right, so let's uh, let's dive into Nox and why you might need Nox. So um, how? So uh, you know, I don't know how. How do we do reactions? Show of hands, reactions, uh, or thumbs up, or clapping. I don't know. 
how many of you have heard of React? Okay. I'm going to say near 100%. How many of you have heard of Vue.js? Okay. Actually, well, learned it that right now. <laughs> oh, good. And so, uh, you know, there's a, the original way of building like a React application was doing something like either rolling your own from scratch or using something called Create React App. Uh, and so, Create yeah. React App, like, you know, was like kind of the basic, like, get started. Um, you know, to build a React application. And well, it's not that great. And so uh, along come other things um, such as like Gatsby, uh, which is a you know, Jamstack uh, solution. Uh, and this other thing called Next.js. And so Next.js is, yeah. a, is like a, a framework built by a company called Vercel. They, they changed their name. It used to be called something else. Um, uh, for cell JS, for cell, there we go. So for, for cell is a hosting platform. Um, they make Next.js. That's like, like a, a thing that they make. It's an open source product. Project it's Next, that they, they -E -T. Yep, but that's React, right? And so uh, it does like server-side rendering and rehydration and all this other fun stuff. So you can think of it as like a, a much better experience about a much more opinionated experience of how you would build a React application, right? It's the, it's the easiest way to think about it. So like routing, um, things are thought about for you instead of you having to make decisions. Um, it's probably the easiest way to think about it. Um, so in the in the view, you know, arena, there was there's a couple of random things. Um, there's like a, a Gatsby, a clone based on view that hasn't had much traction. Uh, I can't even remember the name of it um, and some other things, but the one that stuck around the most in view land seems to be Nuxt, right? And so Nuxt is essentially the, is essentially the parallel for view that Next.js is to React, right? So it's like an application framework, like building your, your you know, um, view application. So you can kind of think of view in a couple of different ways, right? And I know a little bit about what you're using it as, right? So you're kind of peppering view into different components to kind of make them more reactive, I think, right, Peter? Yeah, that's part of it. Or, well, we're actually, you know, we, we have this fun project of, you know, uh, replacing the engine while the airplane is flying, of trying to basically move data and functionality from an old version of uh, the web application to the new version. And so as pieces are built or moved to the new one, we're basically still having the users log into the old one and showing them a Vue.js mm -hmm. page that fetches the data from the new one. So, um, and and also hopefully we will more or less, as they, when they log into the new one, they will basically get more or less the familiar Vue.js pages that they've already been using because we build right. them so they will work essentially in both web applications, maybe with a little yep. different styling. So yeah, so I think from from your perspective, Nux doesn't necessarily make sense because it's kind of a full, you know, wrapper around a project, right? It's like it, it's like an application, like right. it's just to build a view based application versus adding view in here or there, right? Or building like specific you know components with view. Right, um, like poking at the you know, docs, it looks yeah more like it's for building a single page application rather than yeah building. Hey, on this page, I want this half the page to be a view component from mm -hmm. sort of from somewhere else, which is what we're doing. Yeah. Right. Yep. And so essentially, you know, again, you know, just like Next.js and React kind of has opinions about how it builds itself. And then, you know, there's like an ecosystem around that. That's the same way. They're working on Nux3 right now. Um, so there's like a new version of Nux kind of like eminently coming out, uh, like sometime at the end of this year, I think. Um, which will be view three based. So there's multiple flavors of view. There's view two and there's a view three. Nuxt three will be based on view three, whereas Nuxt currently is based on view two, version two. So that's the other difference. So like any of the new stuff in view three will be in Nuxt three, but it isn't necessarily in Nuxt whatever version it, they call this now. Um, so that's the other thing to think about. But you know, if you were, let's say you were fully decoupling your project and you decided Vue is the framework you wanted to go in on, like you could build your application with Vue, right? 
and you might use Nuxt is kind of the leading um, way of doing that uh, is the easiest way to think about it. Right, and then I heard about it because of this other thing called, of course, Druxt, <laughs> which is a Drupal specific integration to Nuxt.js. Um, so, and I, I didn't know about this and I'm not sure it would solve our problems, but it's actually a little bit similar to the stuff, yeah, that we've been working on on our own version, which it um, basically builds up essentially a schema or a you know, definition of your entity types based on mm -hmm. fetching data from your Drupal site from JSON API. And then it somehow builds up possibly a static representation of all that mm -hmm. stuff. And then it uses it to Render the front end somehow. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So again, like uh, the the further decoupling of Drupal or the headlessness of Drupal. Right. There's also a project called Next.js for Drupal. <laughs> so again, you can see like the the camps forming, right? There's the view camp, there's the React camp, you have the Next right. camp and the Next camp, and everybody's trying to figure out, you know, uh, ways forward. Uh, you know, depending on on what their team knows. Back to that that idea of um, you know, if a company knows this, they'll, in, in some regards, at least have some resources around people learning the technology stack that they have, um, in theory. Um, and so, yeah, as, you know, essentially, like if you wanted to use a Drupal backend and use Nux as your front end application, then it seems like Drux would be at least a logical starting point to look at, right, to see how they did it even if you don't go all in on it. Right. Um, yeah, you know, I, yeah, we'd be curious how they did it. And yeah, we yeah, wrote a custom rest endpoint as opposed to be, so that we could try to like optimize this for a single rest request, but like actually caching some of the stuff as static files might make sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know, yeah, I'm curious, but it's like, we're also as I said, you know, we're in flight, so it's a little hard to take pause and really like deep dive in, in some options. Yeah. No. Yeah. And who is Drux? <laughs> right. These are always the questions you have to ask yourself. Like, who's behind this thing? Right. Like, how many people are there? Uh, and, you know, so there's two people that are part of Drux. Yeah. It was Australia based. Yeah. It's Deciphered, who I think is a pretty heavy contributor, but I don't know. Mm. Next, yes, for Drupal is Chapter Three, which is an agency out of San Francisco. Yeah. yeah so you know again you know your mileage may vary right so right. like you know I like with any with any tech choice you know once you start relying on open source software and people maintaining it you have to wonder if like you know you use that thing as a, as a place to start uh contribute to it or you know roll your own right i think it's, it's the other way to think about it too right, right. because you know at some point you know or at least knowing like there's an escape hatch, right? Like, oh, well, it's really just a specific configuration of Nux. So escaping from it won't be that bad, right? You know, so, um, right. or, you know, it's just Nux next with some Drupalisms in it. You know, escaping from it won't be that bad. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, so it's like, yeah, Druxt has all of like six contributors. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, okay, but it's a lot of code. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I don't know. Hard to say how solid it is, right? Um, right. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want to dive into some of those other topics. Um, sure. I mean, like I said, or, we or have talk plenty of time for other things too. So yeah. All right. Well, so why don't I? Since this is kind of the topic, so the reason, right? I got in this is this. So this drugs thing claims, and as I said, I. The, the work I'm going to show you was basically done before I even knew that the structs thing existed. Um, but as, as I understand, basically the, the Drux project's goal is to, it uses just JSON API to figure out kind of the structure of your um, content entities. Um, and so anyone who's not familiar with this stuff, stop me. So, so Drupal eight and nine, um, right, it's a PHP application. The kind of the general 
catch-all term for data objects is entities for reasons that I don't know. I guess it was better than the alternatives. Um, <laughs> uh, broadly speaking, the entities are either content, um, you know, like a blog post or configuration. Um, Drupal is highly configurable, so you can add new, essentially new data fields to a content type. So if you have a blog type, you can add additional fields to it, like a, a taxonomy reference to a taxonomy term. So you can pick what category the thing is in, or a, you know, an additional text field or an image field, because you want an image with your blog post, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so Drupal uses, <laughs> the current version, Drupal uses essentially a configuration, a set of configuration objects to keep track of, you know, which fields are associated which with, which with content type, and in fact, even to define the content types themselves. So there's like a very generic entity type called the node, um, or you can write a custom one, but the node is like your most standard content type, content entity. And then the blog is a type of node and the the fact that blog exists is because there's a configuration object defining the blog node type. Um, so if, feel free to ask questions if that doesn't make sense. But um, so kind of the picture here uh, we have is then there's also configuration entities um, to tell you when you want to see an entity or when you want to have the edit form for an entity, like which of the field data fields should actually appear and which ones um, and in what order, let's just say, and you know, configure other things about them. But just for the for the big picture you? there. Sure. Oh, uh, you know, uh, Drupal is very resource consuming. How it has improved since, let's say, Drupal, uh, let's say four or five years ago to now. How 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 you guys do to actually uh, deal with the you know, Drupal has been such a heavy application that can scale so quickly and add so many, you know, and use so many resources in your servers. Hmm. Well, um, I would say there's a few different things. I mean, it's, you know, there have been some performance improvements in the application itself. I think also um, PHP language improvements have helped uh, significantly with that. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's a trade-off because, you know, for us, we're, you know, so I'm dealing with a web application for, it's for authenticated users and, you know, we need a very sophisticated business logic. Um, so there's not really any way around doing a lot of processing, right? Because it's a very, it's what the user sees is very specific to that user. You know, we have to do a lot of access controls on the data. Um, if you want a fast website, then probably, and it's just for not for you know anonymous users, then you know that's you want to go. There's a, lots of ways to make that work really fast. You can use a CDN, um, so that basically caches the HTML content, um, so it's prefetched, you know, and users you know just see it almost instantly. Um, or you can use something like Gatsby or one of these other JavaScript frameworks to build essentially a static website and use your Drupal site as a essentially a content archive or content repository. So I think it depends on your use case, right? So um, I think if you're, yeah, if your goal is, is to deliver a very fast experience to, um, Anonymous users, that's that's not hard. It doesn't actually matter that Drupal's a little bit slow. I mean, yeah, some users occasionally will see a slow page, but for the most part, that's not a problem. What was the one um, that we saw recently that was really nice? The Philadelphia Craft Show site, which is, I think they built it on Pantheon. I think it's Drupal 9 and it's using their CDN and like this pages are lightning fast to load. So take a look at that if you if you're like Drupal can't be fast okay go load a site like that which is you know recently built and feels extremely fast to the end user even though if you're the administrator it might still feel a little bit slow to load each page does, does that make sense 
Yes, yes, it makes sense. So, yeah, so there's not an easy answer, but there, oh yeah, so Sean got the link, link there. Is that, hopefully it still looks really fast, Sean, when you load that. It's still pretty dang fast, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's a nice, it was a very attractive site. I remember when that, when that came out a few weeks ago. Um, so, um, yeah, let me just show maybe what we're doing then for motivation, um, if people are interested in this. So I'll show you a little bit of, the, probably a tiny bit of PHP code and a little bit of the Vue.js code. Um, let me just get back to where I was. Okay. So um, I'll share my screen. Okay, so we this is this is on uh, localhost. This is demo data. So, um, uh, so you're not seeing anything actually special um, in that sense. Um, but yeah, as I said, this is kind of our current work project. Um, and what you can see here on the screen is um, we are in this um, section of biomaterial reports. Um, and actually there's a lot of fun stuff going on. This, this page is basically dynamically generated from each of the types. Um, then each of the pages under here um, is Vue.js. You see we have this um, report and we have a library. Um, and the library are kind of generic ones and this report lists the ones that are associated to specific research groups. Um, so that this in and of itself, right, is not hard if we were doing this for just one, but what's hard is the fact that if I go back, right, I've got, um, most of these aren't populated. I forget what else I've populated here. I think biological toxin has a couple, um, right. Um, and for example, these fields shouldn't be showing up in this page for biological toxin, because biological toxins being proteins do not have genetic modifications. Um, but see, that's part of the problem. So for every one of these, I have different fields present. Um, this has a name field. My bacteria don't have a name field. Um, and so I've already got a dozen of these. And if I wanted to hand code the list of fields, the order of fields uh, for each of these tables and configure all these filters, um, that would be a bunch of work. And then my boss would come in and ask me to add two more, right? Or ask me to change the order of all of them. Um, so uh, we also have, you know, a different uh, display of these. Uh, uh, it's just annoying me. It's hard to navigate my tabs with the uh, other controls up here for, um, let's see, can I just go full screen? That doesn't really help. Um, sorry, just the zoom controls are kind of in the way. Um, so if I'm here right in another tab, I have that lab, you see the lab, this page spits out all of the different tables for all the different types. Um, and in this case, I just have these, um, these pulled into this, this particular lab. Um, so again, you know, it's, it's the, it's not that each one of these things is hard to implement. It's that uh, having this dynamic set of them is hard. And as I said, we have um, um, so we have here um, different types of these materials, right? And adding a new one is literally as easy as clicking this button. Um, and if I do that, the goal is like all of this stuff basically should magically start appearing. Um, um, and that's, that's kind of the challenge here. So there's, there's a bunch of moving parts, but I want to just dive in on a, one of the pieces as I said was kind of similar, a little similar to the structs thing. Um, and that's how we're basically controlling, for example, um, the list of fields, the order of fields in this table, list of fields, order of fields in this filter, um, and also things like, um, the ordering and which fields appear when I go click on this thing and, and show, show it fully rendered. Um, and, uh, you know, we wanted, basically we have in our company, uh, we have other, some other little tricks we built, like we can pop this thing out in a, 
more full screen thing so you can see all of it with more space. Um, but you know, we have at our company a mix of people who are developers and a pick, mix of people who are subject managers, experts. I'm kind of bridging it because I also have a bit of science background and a PhD in addition to doing this stuff. Um, so, but for most, most of the developers don't really know or maybe you know aren't interacting with the customers to understand how they would prefer this data to be presented. Um, so part of the goal here is we want uh, the product people who understand the biology or science uh, or who are spending time talking to the customers as opposed to doing development uh, can actually reconfigure these things um, and therefore cut short you know, the amount of turnaround time uh, to, to improve the product. Um, and so what I'll show you is, so this is what we have here, biological toxins, right? Um, let me just go back here to biomaterial energy types. Okay, so we've got biological toxin. Um, so we've got a lot of different options here. This is Drupal's built-in field UI that I've turned on. We normally obviously don't have this on in production, uh, but for development, sure. Um, so the first thing here is the um, manage fields. So if we wanted to like actually add a new data field, we could do that right here. Um, but the first one I want to show you is manage display. Um, and you see we have a default display um, that shows you that kind of full view of the entity data. Um, and now we have these other ones that are not standard that we defined ourselves, listing table, listing table filters, and search results. Um, let me just show you what's in the listing table. And as I said, like, you know what? These things shouldn't be in the table, all right? Those two things should not be in the table. Um, the name, maybe the name field shouldn't be in the table either. Toxin name definitely should be there. Um, and the cast number, if we have one, should definitely be there, right? And the notes, no notes should not be in the table. Um, maybe let's say max quantity stored should be in the table, right? So uh, now, so you see, I've just reordered these things, drag and drop. I could definitely do this as someone with a science background and not a programming background, save. Okay, now I'm gonna go over here, right? And you, know, you see what this looks like. Um, and hopefully I didn't screw it up too much, but if I reload the page, um, apparently the name was, this genetic modifications fields added the cast number, added the quantity stored, um, and removed those other things. And let's let's go back add add back this name that maybe was the right thing to have, um, right? And just like that, now it's back here in the table. Um, oh, and let's say I wanted. Um, I'm gonna go over here to this table filters, and let's say I want to, I don't know what, add quantity stored as a filter and take off risk group. Hit save over here and immediately um, you see max quantity stored is in the filters um, and I, you know, can filter by it, right? So just like that, I've dynamically reconfigured the front end of the application. Um, the other, yeah, the other fun thing we'd be doing in the, let's see where we were in the, in here, you see, um, we have the ability to add, um, items, um, to the lab. And so I can search, um, for bacteria to add, um, so right here, right, I've, found this thing and I'm gonna add it to my lab. Um, and you see the list of fields here, genus, species, and select agent, right? But maybe, you know, and, oh great, okay, can add that to lab. Maybe I'm like, you know what? I really wish I knew what the risk group level was or the bio, bio safety level required. Um, so you know what? I'm gonna go over here to my search results. And I'm gonna say for, um, 
manage display, search results. Um, I would like to see the biosafety level up here also. Save, go back, search again. Um, oh, look, now I've got biosafety containment level showing up in the search results. Um, so that's kind of the idea. Um, so maybe I'll just pause there and see if anyone has any questions before I do a quick, uh, quick show of what the code looks like. Or at least, at least bits of it. We certainly, we, I won't go into the full thing here because this is, you know, built by like three people over several weeks. <laughs> um, okay, so if no questions, let me just show you um, kind of one of the easy ones here, right? So this is the, this view component is called biomaterial view dot view. Um, and it is literally just the, and let me zoom in a little bit. Can people see this? So um, this is very like a pretty boring view component, um, all things considered. Um, and you can see that uh, if you look at this div right here, basically this div, or this sorry, this template element, you know, wraps some divs, and basically the template is literally just essentially a for each over a list of fields, um, and that's how we get these this dynamic kind of behavior because um, this thing. Then if we go and look at it. Um, all right, so the display display field, where is it? Um, is basically, um, sorry, I haven't looked at this in a few days, but basically, right, so we're doing um, two things here. So we're doing, we're basically calling a rest endpoint to get the entity, entity view display. This is a, Custom rest endpoint. It's actually not that exciting, um, um, and we're basically just um, the way this this kind of um, rest call works. We're using Axios in the back end, and it basically lets you make a rest, any kind of rest call. And this is an arrow function, right, that gets the response, um, and the response. Um, we built the rest endpoint so it can actually give you responses back from different types. So it can give you back the bacteria and the toxins in one response. Um, and then basically we're just setting this display data here. Um, and we probably yeah, get display fields um, is then iterating over this display data. Right, so this is a computed property, meaning essentially the result of this function is cached. Um, and then we, um, as I said, are uh, wherever it is and get to and get display fields, right? So that's basically the call to this computed property, which is a cached response output of that function. Um, and then we get the, the actual data in this case uh, through JSON API um so if people have used json api in drupal basically it's like the this is the name of the entity type in other words the kind of content then we have a subtype um and then we have a uuid uh, which uniquely identifies it um so again that's you know if you look at this is really it's really straightforward um the tables essentially do the same kind of thing. And um, the idea there again being the, the display mode is, even though it's sort of conceptually just to show you uh, a single entity, there's no nothing that prevents us from using that list of fields, ordered list of fields um, and labels uh, to build up either a ta table header or to build up a set of filters. Um, so um, these, these components start getting a little more complicated because um, they're using a table component. Um, but basically, um, you know, we have a get fields method that does essentially the same thing. Um, 
right? This is, and this is using Vuex, so it's more complicated. Um, but somewhere in here, uh, when we mount the thing, we um, basically initialize the listings, which goes and grabs uh, that same display mode, um, puts it into the, the data store, and then builds out this table component based on the list of fields and then fills in the data using a JSON API call. Um, and then finally, I will just switch to this entity display REST resource. Um, so uh, lots of to chew on here. If people have not seen the way you define a custom REST resource in Drupal 8 and 9, happy to talk more about that. Um, um, let's just scroll down here. The actual, um, let's see. The actual, what's actually going on here is not really that complicated. Um, so, we basically have uh, an entity type. Um, you saw on the path that has the name of the entity type. We're using some Drupal magic to convert just the name and the path to a um, 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 an actual object. Um, and that's with this little magic here, um, where we uh, basically tell this system that this particular piece of the path uh, should be converted into an um, into uh, a type, and same thing for the bundle. Um, and so that's nice because we just magically get instead of getting strings in here, we get already loaded objects based on the IDs that are in the in the path. Um, and basically, the short form of this right is if we have a bundle coming in here. Um, Let's just, that's the case we were looking at mostly. So we're looking at one type at a time. Um, we're, um, you know, basically building up this list of bundles that we're gonna look at here. Um, and we've only got one of them. And if we don't pass anything into there for right now, we're just loading every possible, um, every possible type. Um, that's what this code does. It's basically load by properties with an empty array. So just that literally says load, load all of them that exist because we're not filtering by any properties. Um, and then we, so we built up this, this array of bundle IDs, right? And we for each it, um, and we are calling this method get display data, which is basically loading. Um, the display, which is a, a configuration object. So basically when I went in the UI and rearranged those fields and saved it, it saved a configuration object and this loading that configuration object. Um, and basically I just like filling out an again array with all these things like the label, the definition, um, and any settings, other settings I might want to use in my front end. Um, sorting those based on the weights and then returning them. Um, and that Drupal does some magic to basically turn this response object into JSON. And um, then we get the response back, um, which you know I'm happy to show you if you want to see what that looks like. Um, but it's basically just a list of field names and some, some properties for each one. So that's that's kind of the overview from seeing the front end to seeing the JavaScript to seeing the PHP. Um, as I said, there's a lot to digest here in terms of customer REST endpoints. If people haven't um, seen those yet and you're curious about how Drupal does that, um, we talk more about that or any of this. Um, so feel free to ask questions or I will hand it back to Sean to talk about uh, one of the other topics on the list.
No, stunned silence. Okay. <laughs> well, Just thank you, Peter. That was um, fascinating. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, I, that would that was the lightning tour. So I, I'm really yeah. happy to dive in if, if people want to see part of this in more depth. Um, but um, yeah, it would. It's a lot to digest for sure. If so, if there's a piece of it that, that intrigued you, let me know and we can go back to it. How much of the custom breath stuff is is kind of just iterating over what core gives you and how much of it was like you extending that? Um, it was almost all just loading the configuration core and reformatting it in a helpful way. Um, I think you can even use JSON API to load those configuration objects, but the idea was basically to, there's certain things that are, you don't always get, like sometimes you don't get um, like the options or the field labels for things mm -hmm. initially in the object and you have to go do a second level of a REST request to get all the data you need. So part of the idea here is because we're not kind of caching this JSON in a static file, um, we're dynamically generating each time you look at this table, you know, we want to minimize the number of backend requests that are required. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, if we, so I think the Drux thing took a different approach, right? It used all the different JSON API requests it could to build up this mm -hmm. comprehensive kind of object representing that with everything you would need. So you, it takes probably a little while to build it up, but then you have it in place. Um, I think it's certainly worth considering for us, um, but you know, this is nice for us for now because it, it's, it's so dynamic in terms of reconfiguring the front end. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and look, in some way, right, this is, it's the fact that it's a Vue.js, like this is not really any better than what Drupal does natively in a lot of sense, or with the, the views module, it's it's only, it's better for us because we, as I said, we can present this view component in a different context. So it's mm -hmm. being served in a different context, not in the Drupal site that actually has the data. So it's sort right. of a front end, front end use. Yep. So you had some other things on that list that looked like some uh, So many random, stuff. random yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> or we uh, also have, always have time for q and people. Yeah, let's see if anybody's got questions before we just start going down stuff and then we can maybe pick one of these things to look at. If anybody's got a question and wants to unmute or if somebody wants to, um, yeah, chat a question, go for it. Oh, and I guess we should we should remind everyone that yeah, if you if you are using Drupal, Drupal eight end of life is November. So you should be thinking really, really hard about Drupal nine upgrade if you have not already. <laughs> Welcome to my fall. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it goes to end of life, everyone's gonna realize that they should have Hired you sooner, huh? No, not no. the time. <laughs> Already hired. Oh, Steve, uh, Steve has a question. A good, affordable Drupal hosting service. Um, unfortunately, good and good and affordable are often orthogonal. Um, <laughs> uh, well, uh, but, trying. Just um, I didn't know if anyone had came across. I mean, you know, Pantheon is per site and it can end up breaking the bank on very small nonprofits. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I don't know what, has anyone looked at like the Maisie products? I mean, there's a bunch of people doing other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're based in Europe. Um, it's called Lagoon. Mm. Repeat? It's called Lagoon. Their product. Okay. Uh, again, that's probably a more. <laughs> uh, Alana could talk about this because that's where she works, I believe. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I that looks very dev oriented. A, yeah. Oh, yeah, very dev oriented. Not a point and click. Um, uh, Matt uh, Lamon, who used to be at uh, Commerce Guys, whatever they became, who's now doing his own thing. Uh, 
he had asked this question on Twitter not that long ago, going like, "Hey, I want to I want to host something really cheap. Where do I put it that gets me like all the bells and whistles I want without you know necessarily you know, paying like you know an Aqua or platform or Pantheon or something like that." I don't right. know what he ended up going with, but um, you know, might be one one way to look at it. Um, Maybe you could define what what is important. You know, what are the things that you just can't live without when it comes to that type of uh, hosting? Um, well, basically, it comes down more to reasonable tech support to comes to response in a reasonable amount of time and actually know something about Drupal, uh, you know, a composer Drupal environment. Mm. That's, I guess, what I would suggest as um, requirements. Stun silence here. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't do, you know, I do some pretty basic hosting. I've been using Pair Networks in Pittsburgh. It's P-A-I-R.com. And it's, um, you know, they, uh, in terms of supporting a uh, composer, it's, it's, um, it's, it's basically, I will, um, you know, run composer on my local machine and then I'll just send the, um, what is it, the make file or, or whatever they call it now, but um, the lock file, the lock file, you know, I'll just send that, that up and just have it build from there, you know, and, and it's, um, I mean, in terms of just general, you know, PHP hosting, you know, opens, you know, they, they're, I think they run on, um, some of their stuff is on FreeBSD. The other one, a lot of it's on Linux. Um, but it's you know they're they've been around for a long time. Um, I've been a customer of them for like twenty years. Um, you could get set up on a shared hosting account for like ten bucks. Well, and, and shared is uh, is always I, a, I'm, I've always found that to be a disaster. Uh, I've had I have some Drupal seven sites that um, are are you know pretty. In, you know, it, I found that they actually run better on a shared set up with pair because they, um, you're not, um, you know, metered to a certain degree. So they, and they don't tend to over, um, you know, they don't tend to put too many sites on one shared server. So um, I've actually had some sites run better on a shared environment than, you know, when it's on like a, a virtual machine or whatever. Yeah. VPS. Um, yeah. VPS. Um, so again, I think if, if you were just sort of developing something and you wanted to show it to people, I mean, there, there's, they are not, the support is not, um, you know, specific to Drupal, um, but they're, they're very good. I mean, they know, um, they're, they're, they're just, just about everything else really, the hosting, um, you know, you get, you can get an answer really quickly, um, if, depending on the, depending on the level of the hosting account, you know, you can give them up, you can give them a call and you, you can get somebody on the phone, you know, who's able to help you, <laughs> you know, like, it's not like you have to go through a bunch of people to get to somebody who's like, you know, going to be able to take care of what you need to get done. So anyway. Pair, yeah. is it pair.com? Pair yeah. P, P, P A I R.com. Okay. I see. Yeah. yeah. They've been around for a long time. Times so at least at least you know they're not like a fly by night in terms of <laughs> yeah I just created, uh, wasn't yeah. Um, yeah I'd um, okay um, second question if, uh, if nobody else has another question um, there were some some issues and don't ask me to enumerate but uh, as far as with um, um, composer as far as uh, always sometimes is my nemesis. Um, as far as diagnosing it when it when it goes bad, um, newer versions are happier. I mean, Composer two is way faster and uses less memory. Yeah, um, as far as uh, diagnostic uh, messaging and things like that, so when you know to be able to figure out what, when it tells you there's errors uh, to make sense yeah. of them. That's always been my problem. It's like when something goes bad, then now what do I do? And I find I'm stuck. Right. I, I don't know if they've improved the error messaging. Um, I've happily not hit 
a tricky edge case recently with our stuff. Um, so maybe do you, can you describe like a case where you hit a tricky situation or what, what caused that? Um, I would have to bring it to the next meeting. I, I don't have it handy. Okay. I have to go through it again and capture it. I mean, I, I have a couple, uh, believe it or not, a couple of little Drupal 7 sites that need to be uh, fixed, you know, and uh, I get uh, oddball errors trying to update them. And I, I can't make sense of the errors. So you, you, were you using Composer with those? No, sorry. No. Um, no. But okay. um, I mean, maybe you could. Fair, but, you know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, right. But I'm saying I have eights and sevens, but I'm say, I, I get mixed my uh, metaphors here. I have sevens okay. that I'm going to have to uh, get up to nines, and I have eights that I'm going to have to get up to nines. The eights I've had uh, a couple of issues with with these uh, oddball errors, and I just didn't know what to make of them. Hmm. So. Don't know what to say. Uh, I'll, I'll bring samples to next time. That would be more intelligent. I guess I was just looking to see if there was any hosting companies that um, were more affordable, um, that um, had some experience with Drupal support. Yeah, well, I mean, I put in the chat the you know, link to the official hosting page on Drupal.org, which has some of the usual suspects and some that I don't know well. Yeah, well. Um, well. And I mean, I think the, um, you know, some I of them one advantage of those is they're at least supporting the Drupal project if, if they're on the page. Um, yeah, but then one, one in one uh, Ionis uh, supports uh, Drupal, I mean, you know, uh, the Drupal org and uh, they, <laughs> they're hopeless when it comes to, I had to get off of them. Right. So uh, that just because they support them, that doesn't mean anything useful. Right. Um, I, I mean, I appreciate the input, uh, but I just, uh, um, that I don't use that as a criteria. The fact that they're supporting Drupal.org, uh, that doesn't mean that they actually know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I actually, the current uh, hosting service I have was supporting Drupal.org at one time. Uh, it's Viox, V-I-U-X. And um, I mean, support's generally pretty good, but um, they have no clue about uh, Drupal at all. Mm -hmm. Who's next? I think Ian has his hand raised. Yeah, it's a trivial thing. At the last uh, Drupal camp, one of the uh, companies that did training, I think they were from Long Island. Can you remember who they were? Mm -hmm. That's. Um... Uh, hold on, let me just find his Twitter because it's easier than me thinking of what his business is. Uh, or go to the Drupal Camp website because their logo is probably still sitting there for three years. Find it on, on the Camp website. Sego Solutions, S E G O. All right, yeah. S E G. Yep, here we go. Can you post it in the chat? Yep. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, that was an easy question. <laughs> I told you it was trivial. Yeah. Steve, if you want to bring some of those composer things next time, that'd be good because I run into a whole bunch of random, uh, annoying edge casey things, even though I'm using composer too, too, like just like weird dependency, you know, health, uh, trying to sort things out because you pinned a version to something and something else isn't happy about that or, you know. Right. It's usually when you pin something that you you get these weird or 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 uh, uh, yeah a package you're using has decided to pin to something and then it mm -hmm. blows up yeah patches that no longer patch and then cause your thing not to update you know fun well stuff. that's that's one of the problems <laughs> the problems i had with some of the drupal 7 sites is that uh, you know i got them at the point where i can't even patch them correctly anymore so mm -hmm. that they need to just be rebuilt from from scratch, but uh, I was attempting to, but they uh, just get these um, nasty errors. So yes, mm -hmm. yeah, I I just finished my largest seven to nine migration, 
and I went the upgrade route and I just was never again, just custom migrate your stuff. Yeah, well, that's right. I already figured that one out. <laughs> it's not worth it. Like, can you, can you, know, you tell us about that, Sean? Uh, well, it, it should have been a lot quicker uh, as with all CrowdCG projects, we, we take our, our time with pandemic life. Um, but just keeping the content updated got to be a pain in the butt. So I know like uh, in July, I wanna say I was talking about um, like, uh, what, was, what were we doing? We, we were skipping the node IDs and the revision IDs, remember? Mm. Uh, we talked about that little thing where I wrote like a little custom module that basically had a hook update uh, that would increment beyond where the client would be number wise in their nodes and revision IDs. And then that, uh, that really just ugly had anything with a freaking ID, like media and files and, you know, a whole bunch of other random things. So like, you know, uh, that like also, like if we added an image and the media IDs then didn't sync up anymore, you know, there were other mm. random things that happened. So like, you know, it just wasn't worth the hassle that uh, did. It launched, launched yesterday. So uh, mm. things seem to be going all right. Uh, all content was there, a little bit more hands-on than I wanted it to be. Um, but, um, you know, functionally it's essentially the same site. So it wasn't like, you know, nothing really changed about the site. There's some new fields added on a content uh -huh. type or two. We added a landing page content type that uses layout builder, um, you know, and some uh -huh. custom block types, nothing, nothing crazy, but you know, uh -huh. for sure. I've gotten very good at writing, um, you know, migration files and dealing with the migration API and, you know, not going that Grout was uh, more problem than it was worth. Mm. There's um, and of course the you know there's a module for that. So there's a module that essentially will run the upgrade migrations, which don't get exported to configuration, and will export them to configuration for you, so that then you can extend them. And that would have saved me at least you know some gray hairs. Mm. Um, <laughs> but you know, we always find that thing like when it's too late. So sure. Um, but yeah. So, fun times. Uh, maybe you could share that module with us. Ah, yes. There we go. What is it called? There are a couple of ones. Uh, uh, media migrate something or other. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, media migration. I think this was one of the ones that was giving me some help. Maybe this is it. And then there is this one called, oh, let, me, let me see if I can think of it. Uh, migrate, file the media, that's one of them. Oh, what is it called? You'd think it would be so easy to find. I don't remember the heck that was called. Uh, it's got a point on it too. Mm -hmm. No. It's like you see people's names in the in the thing. You're like, ah, oh, I can find it not that way. What was it called? Uh, I don't remember what it's called, but essentially it like, uh, uh, I don't remember what it's called. I'll find it and I'll post it somewhere. Um, this is one of the ones, this migrate file entity media, you basically I will write the migration for you from the old media types to the new media types, poor media types. I'll find it. Uh, but like I said, it essentially would take the upgrade configuration that like gets generated by the Drupal upgrade, export it to configuration files for you so that you can then manipulate them. So like, if you know, well, we used to call this field this thing and now we call it this, or, you know, we don't want this value. We want to turn it into this other value. You can do some of that processing. Uh, versus just getting everything over and then having to deal with it after the fact. Um, you know, and like I said, you know, you know, media still is the bane of my existence in Drupal land. 
Um, yeah. It's just like, uh, it's just, I, I feel more confused, even though it's better in some bizarre way. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's not, it's not very user friendly still. I feel like there's like some serious, like, hey, you know, this is how it should work, or this is how it should upgrade, and stuff like that. That's like, it's like really important for, you know, the project to kind of continue to survive. Um, and I feel like it's still lacking in some ways. Um, anyway, but yes. Um, so uh, we have about a half hour left. Anybody's got a question, drop it down. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about these five things real quick and maybe we can look at one of them. So I'm gonna give you like a third, like a 10 second pitch on each of them. Uh, this small CSS uh, is basically a collection of some front end, modern front end code for building layouts and different things. So there's a whole bunch of examples of like using CSS grid um, and stuff like that. Um, the shoelace thing is a, uh, is a web components project. Uh, so basically there's a whole bunch of um, like pre-built um, web components that you can use in your projects. Uh, we can look at what that means. Um, we talked a lot about Vue tonight. So Petite Vue is a, um, is a basically like an inline version of Vue that's not for what Peter was doing, which was like single file components. Um, but basically it's like sprinkling Vue in if you want to do like some if statements and show statements and stuff like that. Um, hmm. There's another JS library called Alpine JS, uh, and so this would be like the petite view is kind of uh, Alpine JS was a reaction to view single file components being too complicated when you just wanted to sprinkle it in like jQuery, and so petite view is kind of doing that, but within the view context and construct. Uh, it's a ra relatively new project, um, um, and then Vite JS is uh, also from the people who uh, Evan who makes Vue, uh, and that's basically like a um, what is the best way to put it? Um, it it's like a bundler for your for your, uh, for your application, uh, but it uses uh, ES modules, so it can do things a lot faster. I've converted a few things from Create React app over to that, um, just because it loads faster on my computer. It, it's got less files that have to be manipulated. It just makes my life a little bit easier from that perspective. Um, and this Astro is a new um, site generator thing that's come out recently and uh, Netlify like backed it today, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. Uh, but it's, it's more geared towards, again, HTML, CSS, JavaScript sprinkled in. <laughs> versus it being like all JavaScript all the time and then you render an HTML file. Um, so um, that would be uh, one other thing to look at. And the interesting thing about Astro is essentially like you can bring your your own, um, you're gonna bring your own framework with you as well, right? So you can bring React or Vue or something else uh, into it, um, into its template system. So you kind of don't have to leave your, your niche but get a better experience. And it's from the people who created Snowpack, uh, which is a bundler, I think. Um, so anyways, lots of random things. Uh, so anybody have a preference? Astro. Astro? You, may, you, know. you sold me. It sounded interesting, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm sort of curious about it. it yeah, it sounds like a very complicated thing to build a static site, but yes. Sometimes. Everything is <laughs> nowadays. Right. Uh, right. Okay. So you know, basically, there, there's, there's the tagline, uh, which is what I said: less client-side JavaScript. Um, uh, and let's just kind of look at, look at one of these things. Uh, let's kind of dive through it. All right. So I'm not going to spin up locally. We can look at it. Let's see. Let's look at that code sandbox thing. The less stuff I have to install on my computer, the better. Oh, the uh, Zoom taking up all my bandwidth. <laughs> all right, so um, I'm happy about something. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so Snowpack's watching for changes. All right, hello, Astro, awesome, right? So it's a markdown file, right? So basically, uh, it looks nice. Oh, it looks HTML. It's like actually HTML and it's importing markdown. So you can actually put H markdown inside your HTML. So, oh, it's a read only, let's fork it. Oh, geez. <laughs> Five hours later. Think about it. Has it been forked? I'm assuming it has. All right, it's rebuilding. So, all right. So basically, there's a whole bunch of marks down here. Uh, if anybody can recite to me the uh, Syntax for a links in Markdown. That'd be awesome. I never remember it. Uh, it's, it's something crazy like this, like right? Brackets and parentheses. Yeah, uh, it's the bang. The um, I usually the, is that images. Yeah, I think brackets in front of the parentheses for the text and parentheses for the link. Let's just try. So put put instead of a bang, put. You go the other way. Building. But... It's still building. I think it's bracket and then square bracket. Yeah, I think it's square brackets front. It's the parentheses for the link <laughs> and square brackets for the text. I think. Oh my gosh! You were almost right. there. Almost there. Wait, and then they got to be. <laughs> yeah, embedded it. I don't know. <laughs> Before or after? That's the real question. I think after. I think that'll give you a way. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's before. Let's try before. Nope. <laughs> all right. So I don't remember Markdown. Sorry. It's all good. All right, anyway, so if I could type a link in Markdown, that'd be great. Um, I do know how to do bulleted lists, though, so let's go add a bulleted list. Why is it not rebuilding? Oh, does this thing make me save? Yeah, it makes me save the file. So code sandbox is essentially like, you know, development in the cloud. We no, may it should have be to... square bracket text in front of parentheses around the URL. All right. So we were right at one point. <laughs> hmm. Square brackets for text, so Drupal camp, MJ, and then parentheses. We think. Oh my gosh, it's so slow. I guess it beats being on my local machine. And now I gotta save it again and it's gotta rebuild. But anyway, so, okay, so we have one component there, right? So let's see what else we got. So import, uh, what else we got? Well, I'm assuming we have more than that and components. So we can do import. What other components do we have? Nothing helpful. Uh, why would it tell me? Documentation. Owners. Syntax. All right, so we can import various see, things. Built in. Components. Code is one. Markdown is one. Prism. And debug. I know the debug is from Astro Debug, but you do code from Astro Components. And that lets you type code. Type formatted code. code formatted code, but <laughs> it's not very nice. 
<laughs> let's let's make it angry. <laughs> actually, I'm, you actually have to put in the as an element code equals, and then on the on the code component. Yeah. And then open it like that, or is yeah. it single quotes back okay. or something? Now it's curly braces. Oh, of course. Oh man. Uh, closing slash. I know you got a separate element. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's not working because a a I'm gonna assume it does not have PHP support. <laughs> 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 I just wanted to see for fun. Yeah. Didn't echo anything. So I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume, oh, wait, 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 this has to be in back text, right? Maybe. Yeah. Try that. Nope, still not happy. I'll change the language, language to JavaScript. Then. It doesn't seem to be. You have to save somehow? It doesn't even look like it's doing anything. No, I'm saving it. Uh, alert. One, two, three. Mm. It's just not happy. All right, well, so we're not impressed with Astro. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Well, again, it's also like super duper new, right? Mm -hmm. Where yeah. did you find, where did you find said code component? Um, all right, so here, let's go through, let's go through this, uh, this stuff, right? So there's this thing called the Astro file. Um, it's a single file component, right? Um, this three line file is valid Astro component. So class example, div hello world, right? Cool. Um, has styles, big thing, do styles. Astro page example, okay, nothing we haven't seen before. It's basically writing HTML. And then has front matter thing, so we can do some front matter stuff. Um, they can do imports. They can do JSX. dynamic HTML. So that's kind of nice, like, you know, looping over something quickly. Nothing too crazy here. Plus. Um, do, do, do. Uh, so comparing Astro to JSX. Okay, nothing great there. Their nail is the same. Uh, doesn't require JS imports. Right, it's a little bit closer to HTML. Special characters are just HTML characters and not these crazy ass things. HTML comments. Basically, one thing I saw today was like routing you can do a little bit better. So let's look at that. So if we look at the routing thing, basically, you can make dynamic routes, right? So, for example, it's this thing, right? Request a parameter, builds a, builds a file. Okay, some more stuff about routing. Astro components. You're coming here what the Astro components are. Um, nothing really. Oh, there's some built-in components. That's the reference that we were looking for, Peter. 
import mm -hmm. code from thing code. Da, da, da. Yeah, that's what I put in chat. That's not yeah, a lot. That's not working for me. I'm happy. Mm. Well, Markdown didn't work either. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Some, something's not working right in the build. Um, Prism. What is Prism? Much more guys language with specific syntax highlighting for code blocks. Okay, fine. Debug is debugging. One hundred seconds of Astro here. Let's just pop it open. Uh, you can't hear that though, right? No, I, there's there should be some way Zoom lets you share the audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta just do this. audio. Find place now. Show in the which audio. What is uh, if I shared it, it would do it, right? Something done. Nothing helpful. Anyways, all right, so here, I'll share this link. <laughs> when in doubt, share the link. So you can look at that real quick uh, when you get your chance uh, to look at it. But basically, you know, yet another, yet another one of these, um, site builders, you know, with a more modern architecture potentially, right? Uh, other things I think about are like 11 D here. Uh, right, which really gears itself as the static site generator, whereas some other things, it seems like the Astro thing can be rehydrated. So it's a little bit between this and a more full-blown application, you know. I do a whole bunch of templates. It's like weird to me that like all, a lot of projects, there's another project called Remix Run that's like a kind of opinionated uh, React back um that's um not open source um like it's a license model uh -huh. um yeah but they've like architected it to be closer to real html right so you like write html like quality html instead of like these really you know bizarre abstractions around html um it's kind of interesting that like it's the pendulum starting to go that way. There's more and more things that are like, oh no, we'll just write HTML well and don't like totally abstract it into like this bizarro syntax that, you know, doesn't match anything else. Because yeah. um, like even like, even like React where it was like camel case class names for classes instead of just the word class, like CSS, you know, name that right. it normally would be. It's just, mm -hmm. a, just, just something completely unnecessarily bizarre that right. like, makes it more confusing to use, right? Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think the closer you can get to the, the base technology, the better, right? And like, if you do want like some of the nice niceties of the more modern JavaScript stuff, or, you know, a specific CSS approach, like I know that Astro was talking about like CSS modules, which is like a way of, you know, you know kind of componentizing your, uh, or you know, scoping your scoping your CSS styles more specifically, um, mm -hmm. you know, then there's benefits to that kind of thing. Um, but it, at the end of the day, everybody's just it seems trying to do all the fancy things, but like at the end of the day, get as close to to the to the raw source as it would be, um, and doing it the right way. Like I think that's 
that's the challenge. You know, sometimes it's like people don't necessarily know HTML as well as they should, right? They, they use all yeah. these abstractions we think which do it for them. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it seems like at least there's uh, some push to kind of be better about that uh, in some of these new things. Mm. You know, I have to say, I, I've, I've been around long enough to see just about every different framework or construct for building web pages. And it just seems that, um, you know, they, you end up adding unnecessary levels of complexity on top of mm -hmm. something that should be relatively straightforward. Yep. You know, and I think I, 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 um, I remember when, you know, you started when like the version four versions of browsers, like way back when, like, oh, like, early 2000s when it was like dynamic HTML and then you had to go in and, you know, but because Internet Explorer and Netscape had different uh, ways of handling the doc document object model, you had to write, you know, you had to branch your code and, you know, you had to write it all out. And, um, and then jQuery came around and I'm like, this is great. You know, that's one, level, that's one abstraction level that just totally is awesome. And that's funny is that with um, Bootstrap 5 coming out, which is a framework or that's already out, but Bootstrap 5, you know, they've, they've just, they've, they're like, well, you know, we're gonna go ahead and just drop Dre query. And, you know, now we're back to, you know, writing out um, our JavaScript, um, just, just gen, you know, generic JavaScript to, you know, man manipulate those things. And I just thought it was interesting to have that all go full, full circle. But I think there's so many times when I've, I've, I think that we, we look to try to like, it's like a holy grail of like, wow, if we get the right combination of different tools, will these, these websites are just going to write themselves. <laughs> it ends up, but you end up like, well, yeah, the site took me like two minutes to build and then like 30, 30 hours to like <laughs> set up all my little components to make it all happen, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm a curmudgeon, um, but I, I mean, you know, I, 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 I think it's just, it also just, it's just the, how the rapid fire of how these things come out. It's like somebody's like, yeah, I've got my, I've got my, my stack of, um, you know, tools for, for building web pages now. And, and that, that stack's going to change like every three months, not just like, I'm not talking about like, you know, no JS versus PHP. I'm, I'm talking like, you know, I mean, some some of the things like that. I like I I don't even really, you know, like use or you know. I mean, you know. So anyway, I just wanted to give that comment. <laughs> yeah. I think it can be overwhelming, especially as coming look at people are looking mm -hmm. at it from coming from the outside. I mean, if, if if you're learning this, I would just say just, you know. You know, get get a text. Do it. Do it how I started, which is like get a text editor. Start. You know, get a. You know, start doing some basic HTML, and you know, go from there. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think a lot of these generators, builders, whatever you want to call these things, like they're trying to. One thing, at least, that they realize is HTML has a, a fundamental problem in the fact that it's not reusable well. Right, like, so you couldn't have like a header component, right? Like back in the old days, you had like copy and paste or you did like the includes in PHP, right? To like put the header on all the pages and you had to change the header in the one, the, the, the best thing was you could change the header in the include file in PHP and then it would show up on all your pages, right? Um, and like raw HTML, there's nothing to do that, right? Like you have to write it again, write it again, write it again. And at least one of the, one of the things that these things give you is that reusability or that, you know, the ability to kind of compartmentalize certain aspects of a site so that they can be reused. Um, you know, I could, I could instead do that in PHP too. Manage it a bunch of places. Well, yeah. If you even I, need PHP, you could just use uh, straight server set includes though, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, when that was really included, simple. Yeah. You could yeah. use, you could have used Dreamweaver Dream version <laughs> three, you know, to set up your template files and build it out. You know, 20 yep. years ago, 
Um, but I, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, you know, and I, we all use that. I mean, we, we, we need in order, we, we are in the, um, you know, the competing factories, you have to be able to break these things up into chunks and you don't want to have to, you know, rework um, everything. You want to have it so that, I mean, we're all also uh, dealing with the idea of, um, you know, there's constantly having upgrade sites and technology is changing. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you need to have some way of managing that. And uh, I, yeah. I, I think it's just sort of, um, yeah, it's just kind of like, um, but it can be, you know, I, I think that, I guess my sense has been, it's like when I've gone down and looked at, and looked at some of these things, it's like, it could, it's been sort of diminishing returns, you know, it's, it's, mm. I think it would be different, probably it's just the scale of the websites that I'm building are pretty small. So, yeah. you know, if somebody's doing something where it's like, yeah, we've got 3000 pages or, or it's certainly, you know, um, I think what Peter's doing with this stuff and having to do some rapid prototyping and rapid, you know, and empowering, you know, his scientists um, to be able to kind of design this thing on the fly. That's, but it, but you know, that's I think those are the places where you end up having that investment pay off. Mm -hmm. You know, in Drupal. I mean, obviously we're using mm -hmm. Drupal, and that's that's a tool in itself that's, um, you know, making it a, easier to manage. You know, we're breaking up yep. things into smaller components. But yep. I think when you sometimes you get into the stuff, you know. It can't like in terms of I think when you're building out sort of the basic components of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, like that can you know if you're if you're using something to to build those pieces, it seems to me like that's you know there you're already those, those are all, already pretty basic you know level mm -hmm. um, building blocks you know yep so for sure. And then you have the fact that like 40% of the internet is built on WordPress. So, <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's a, it's a good product that, you know, you know, has a crazy database <laughs> table schema, uh, you know, and, you know, it's powerful enough to do all the things, right. Um, you know, it seems like react, um, and, you know, friends are, tending towards being coming more and more like PHP every release because they're like all going to have server side rendering and all this kind of stuff. Right. And so like at the end of the day, you ended up rebuilding PHP in, in JavaScript, right? Like in a weird way. <laughs> it, it really is interesting to see, um, you know, I've been working with, um, you know, some of the Gutenberg, um, mm -hmm. you know, components and building, you know, just building some basic components out of that, which has got React and PHP and, you know, you've got your, you know, your JSON files. I mean, it's actually kind of interesting. And, and that approach has been just to like, you end up, you just, you get, you just, uh, instead of having like an overarching type of framework, it's like, well, we're just gonna build a little component, you know, like, okay, we're gonna have a, uh, a cover image with a, you know, some text, you know, text title over top of it. And then we'll build in all the things that you need to configure that. And then, um, you know, and render it. And then, um, you know, in, inside it is all the things. Um, yeah, but, you know, basically you, you have the editing that, that part of it and the view part of it, but it's all built in one little, little nugget, um, mm -hmm. with, which in itself is sort of like, again, it's, and you look at that, it's like, well, if you're trying to, you know, enforce some sort of overarching arching templating red, you know, idea that that might be problematic although it's coming out you know it's they're doing things with templates with that now too so you can you know stack a bunch of components together and um or a bunch of what they call blocks you can just sort of put mm -hmm. the blocks together and now you've got you know you can build templates you know that way um anyway i i'm sorry i don't mean to like you know, run away with this conversation here. No, no, it's, all, it's, all, it's, it's good to have a conversation. <laughs> That's what we're here for. We are a sounding board. <laughs> but it would be interesting to see some of that Gutenberg stuff if you if you want to share it at some point too. Yeah, I'll see some people. Yeah, I think it might be interesting. I'll um, 
yeah, I'll see if I can put some stuff together. And I know that like, you know, doing some WordPress work ourselves, like, you know, the fact that it's like kind of moving everywhere in WordPress, you know, now you can, you know, kind of deal with it in the, the widgets and stuff like that. Uh -huh. um, you know, Which is why you the classic widgets plugin. Yeah. <laughs> Or 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 accept your or accept your future overlord known as React. <laughs> I mean, I mean, automatic the company behind WordPress.com, the hosting platform, is like all in. Like they're just buying. They're on like crazy, crazy buy spree. They bought the team behind Frontity, which is a um, like a headless, you know, front end for for WordPress sites, like and some other random things. I saw them like buy a couple of plugins recently. They Medium. Oh, did they? Yeah. No, I thought they bought Tumblr. Is they own Medium too? Yeah, they own Tumblr. They, Tumblr. they bought Tumblr for a song compared to what uh, Yahoo bought it for. Oh, well, yeah, it was Tumblr. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, how, how WordPress evolves and, you know, the the kind of at least semi-modernization of it, right? Like the PHP side, not modern still, you know, but like it's adding all this JavaScript stuff is, is, is the way they're modernizing it to some regard. And I think that's also kind of moving where the market is. People aren't learning PHP, people are learning JavaScript, right? And so like if they can capture some of that market of people who are coming in, then they can, you know, have them be WordPress people um, whereas I think in Drupal, we suffer from the, you need to be PHP people and PHP isn't really a thing that's taught, right? Back to our, our earlier um, conversation. I think that, you know, one thing about these, I mean, from JavaScript to PHP, I think, you know, if somebody learns the basics of programming or even, and you know, that, that, Mm -hmm. You can you can use if you can learn PHP, you'll certainly learn JavaScript or vice versa. You know, right? Yep. Um, but I think um, I think with the challenge for you know just just touching on that, I know that um, we all talked about it before, but I think um, it's just the um, it's just a learning curve going to um, you know basic sort of hunt and peck um, you know function programming and PHP. To where you have this, um, you know, the symphony framework, and you know all of the uh, routing, and you know, um, you know, working within that, you know, that model. Yeah. That's where, you know, that's um, where I think a real challenge is of taking people who, you know, like for example, for me, exa for example, where, you know, I'm, I'm, probably just a, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who can, you know. Uh, rub a couple sticks together and program something, um, you know, when it comes into looking at the complexity of, or just getting, or just learning, it's actually not, not actually that complex, but it's just such a different way of thinking of programming that somebody has to like make that jump. And, yeah. and that's so hard, I think, um, to do, you know? And so I think from a standpoint for, I think the challenge for people, for Drupal is, um, you know, if people are probably comfortable, you know, coding in WordPress, because it's, again, it's not that sophisticated, um, you know, and they look at, they look at, uh, you know, moving, or, you know, um, um, there are, there are some, there are some pretty sophisticated plugins in, in WordPress, but, but, mm -hmm. you know, there are people who are just sort of, you know, learning it um you know again, again it's a it's a it's a jump that they have to make to try to you know if you're going to develop a a, a a module in drupal or do your own little custom thing you know i mean it, it's just there's a learning curve yeah yeah, yeah I, I guess you know i still i mean the there definitely is a I think sometimes the Drupal learning curve is more about how to discover how things work together mm -hmm. than the, than initially being hard. Like it's like you have to figure out what what trick you need to find to figure out how it how it works, and not it's not that once you figure that out, it's like 
straightforward. Um, right. So, you know, with a lot of the stuff, even with the routing, the way it's kind of built on top of and with a few hacks in addition to simply routing. So it's like, yeah, it sort of looks familiar, but it's it's got its own quirks. Um, um, but the view stuff the same way, it's like, you know, I feel like there's a bunch of stuff in there. It's just, you look at it the first time, you're like, I have no idea where the, how this works, <laughs> what it means, right? It's a lot of magic happening. Mm -hmm. So I think, the, I mean, the upside of that, right, is it lets you do things fast, but the downside is um, it can be hard to, hard to, hard to understand it enough to really like feel like you're an expert. Yeah. Good talk. <laughs> Sean, there was one of those items you had. I, oh, I guess we're all done, but I think. Um, oh, yeah. What, what was, uh, can you go back to your, um, your screen? Uh, yeah, I'm Oh yeah, shoelace. So shoelace, that 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 I'll have to check out. That sounded interesting. Yeah, shoelace dot style because everybody's gonna have a fancy TLD now. Uh, yeah, I'll chat it. Where is the chat item? So essentially, it's like you know, a library of web components. And again, I think this is yet another thing that's somewhat early days. Seems like it's just like one guy doing it. <laughs> you know, yeah, so. that's what I was first going to question. How many guys? <laughs> yeah, how many how many people are involved in said project? Uh, quick start. All right, let's quick start. Okay, you link your script, uh, CSS file, and a JavaScript file. And you have a button. Uh, there are the components it has. So it's alert, avatar, badge. All right, okay. Right, ooh. Very exciting. All right, nothing, nothing in, in crazy, but you know, again, like it's the encapsulation of stuff, right? So it's like, you don't have to think about rebuilding the same thing again and again and again. I mean, I, a big thing that is solved by this, like here's a standard way of doing a thing and not messing it up is like accessibility stuff, right? So like, you know, having accessible form labels and all that kind of stuff without somebody having to think about it or tabs, you know? Mm -hmm. Is uh is good. You know, there's a whole, um, I forget the group name, like web components groups to make like standardized things like tabs and stuff like that. Um, you know, because again, you know, why do you want to have to reinvent the wheel every time? You know, and think about all the mechanics of how a keyboard user would use it or how somebody using it with some other type of assistive touch would use it or how it gets read out, right? Like maintaining the state of it, you know, all that kind of stuff. If it can be encapsulated and you go, oh, you know, I want this thing and I'm going to style it myself. Like, but you know that you're not breaking it. There's, there's benefit to that, that kind of thing. Although you like, I feel like we should be farther along than we are with this stuff. <laughs> well, the other problem is you know, stuff that doesn't get backward compatible. Um, if you're a big enough company or you, you got an issue with ha having to support backwards browsers, at least for a good period of time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like if it doesn't work, and you know, if it's just all in latest and greatest, that's great, but it, mm -hmm. it doesn't, um, you know, have a, doesn't end up working out terribly well if it doesn't yep. back, degrade nicely. There it is. Or yep. 
I'm looking at some of these. I'm like, okay, these are really cool. Except for if you get somebody that's really gets nitpicky about how they want things to operate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you just, can you, you know, you can't use it out of the box. So you might have to, um, what can you do to, you have to tend to update it. So, yep. or, and make it match something versus if, and you know, sometimes those business people have a certain way and it, they just won't budge. Yep. So like I guess on the other hand, button. you could say it operates just like this mm -hmm. and you show them and that's the way you say, this is what, how it's going to operate. So. Yeah. Not a, not a lack of other random things floating around the, the, the ether. Anyways, well, and of course, there's the out. who is it from Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania mm -hmm. um, that's in web components, big and uh, oh, Brian Olendike. Yep. Yeah. So I'm wondering what he's got, you know, is what his opinion on like that would be. Yeah. Uh... He's what hack CMS. Well, he, he's big into components, web components. So, yeah, and he built like this whole headless authoring experience thing so. with web components. Okay, well, yeah. I'm going to have to call it a day. Our um, Enciaga is all next month. Or yes, indeed. Hopefully, some of the people that look new to me hopefully will see them back again. Uh, yeah, plug October fourteenth, yeah, seven p.m. Well, I'll be here if we. <laughs> I can. like Stephen with the slow wave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good times. Uh, that happen right, when right. you get retired. Yeah, that's what happens. You you slow down. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you all. All right. Have Thanks, a good guys. night. Bye. Thank you Bye -bye. much. Bye bye. Thank you very much.